G'day, Pastor Blake here. Thanks so much for watching this message today. I pray that this sermon and resource would help grow you in your relationship with Jesus, also in conjunction with a local church. If you have any questions about our church, you can head to our website, devonportcoc.com.au. Again, thanks for watching this message today, and I do hope that it blesses you in your love and devotion towards Jesus Christ. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm James. Uh, and growing up, I thought I had a fairly boring testimony. Uh, I grew up in a Christian family. I went to church every Sunday. I went to youth group every Friday. I went to Camp Clayton every chance that I got, except for one junior boys when I got chicken pox. Uh, but I couldn't tell you the date of my commitment. I know I did it multiple times. Um, and I think each time they were just in bed before I went to sleep. I never made a big deal. Um, I didn't really even have an aha moment when I got baptized. Um, I just did it when I eventually got to grade 12 and was like, oh, I need to do this. Um, my faith has been steady, growing little by little, uh, no big 180 moment, nothing dramatic, no big youth event or altar call. God was always there. So far in our Summer in the Psalms series, we've heard from Samorna about being known from the famous Psalm 139. And last week, Mika asked some big questions uh, about our almighty God looking at Psalm 84. The YouTube videos are still going up this month, so if you've missed them because you're on holiday, um, go check out the Devonport Church of Christ YouTube channel. They're well worth watching. Today, I'll be looking at Psalm 107. Uh, I know the Psalms in general are meant to be poetry and songs, but this Psalm, to me, reads a lot more like a song than many others. Uh, it has sections that sort of look like verses to a song, um, and they have some repetition. And the Psalm itself is quite long, so I'm not going to read through it all to start with. We're going to begin at verse 1, um, and then we're going to mix it up a little bit and read some bits and pieces. So, let's start in verse 1. I'm reading the NLT, but um, here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. If I could just leave the sermon there and empower you guys to go and tell someone your story in the foyer, uh, then I'd do that. Um, tell them how the Lord has redeemed you. And then after you've practiced on someone in the foyer, go out and find a colleague or a friend who doesn't believe yet and try it again. Uh, but... The psalm does have about 40 more verses, and I think most of you guys are prepared to stay here until around 11.30, so uh, there probably is some more that we can um, unpack as we go. But I want you to keep that idea of sharing your testimony um, in mind as we, as we look at this psalm today. This introduction in verses 1 to 3 speaks of a gathered people from many lands, um, the New Living Translation that I read uses the term exiles, and the Israelites' history is full of stories of those in foreign lands or wandering. Uh, so whether the psalmist is considering like those as far back as Abraham, who had his journey to Canaan, uh, whether it was the Israelites in Egypt as slaves, or maybe 
it was the Babylonian exiles. The psalm goes on to speak about the experiences of these gathered people uh, who have been redeemed from their trials. Their experiences that have no doubt been repeated since this psalm was written. So we have in the next verses four case studies, as my study Bible referred to them, or perhaps we can call them testimonies uh, of these gathered people. Four sections, each formatted the same, but they all start by naming a different struggling group. Verse 4 says, Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. Hungry and thirsty, they nearly died. Verse 10, Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That is why he broke them with hard labor. They fell, and no one was there to help them. Verse 17, some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. Some went off to sea in ships, flying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke, and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed up to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits' end. So, what stands out from these verses? Well, my first big point is that sin has consequences. I believe that there is lots of evidence in the Bible that our God is a just God, um, and he gives punishment that, to those who deserve it. He's a God of wrath. And at the same time, he is a merciful God, and he is a loving God. As Mika said last week, our God is a God of paradoxes, and he's far beyond our comprehension. Uh, he can be entirely just and punish those who deserve it, while also being entirely merciful and forgiving those um, and passing over those consequences. But the second and third sections in this passage speak particularly of people who have rebelled against God and their suffering has come as a result of that. Um, they've gone against his will and his plans and they suffer in prison and they suffer illness because of this. I do want to note that I don't think we should take this too far. Uh, I'm in no way saying that the cause of your suffering and what you're going through is because you've done something wrong. Um, we have stories in the Bible as well, like Job, who was a righteous man uh, in the Old Testament, but he loses everything. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus challenges the religious views that disability was a result of the parents or that person's sin, um, which I don't think is correct either. Um, there's no overarching rule. There's no one size fits all. Uh, but unfortunately, we are all impacted by Adam and Eve's decision in the Garden of Eden to disobey God. And sin is a part of all of our lives. So whether we're actively or intentionally disobeying God, uh, we will all find ourselves in situations of physical pain, of grief, of financial stress or homelessness, will be weighed down by burdens or swept up in storms. We have all fallen short and we have no control over these things. And whether God causes them or lets them happen, uh, I don't know, 
But I do think that God is usually at work in some way in these situations. As a father disciplines his children to bring them up in the correct way, God often disciplines us. And this comes out of his love for us and his desire to see us grow um, and grow through hard things. In these hard times, there is a good chance that like these exiles, we will reach our breaking point. Um, we might be like those who feel like they're at death's door. So the series is Summer in the Psalms, and I wanted to pick something that fit with the summer theme, something lighthearted, something joyful. <laughs> so here's the good bit. Okay. Verses 6, 13, 19, and 28 say, Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. My next point is that God honors repentance. Each testimony has these exiles reaching that breaking point, and they cry, Lord, help. It is impossible for us to receive protection, receive freedom, healing, or peace if we don't humble ourselves and admit something is wrong um, and stop trying to do it in our own strength. God does not turn his back on anyone who comes to him in repentance. The minor prophet Joel has a book in the Bible where he talks about a plague of locusts sent against Israel as a consequence for their sin. Uh, and he calls the people to repent. In chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, it says, that is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothes in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. God does not want to punish us. He would much rather see us come back to him. He would much rather see us grow in compassion, in wisdom, grow to be more dependent on him, grow to be more like Christ. I think sometimes God waits just long enough for us to realize that we need him. Nothing can be done without him. Our lives are his, and we are here to serve him. So he calls us to tear our hearts. He calls us to tear our very core. Don't just tear your clothes. Don't just act the part. Don't just mumble sorry because your parents told you to. Don't pretend that you've changed in public, but continue to sin at home, continue to struggle in it at home. God knows your heart. And we have to be genuine in our repentance because God can see that. God knows, and he shows mercy and compassion. I think it's more about that letting go. Um, it's about surrendering to God. God responds to these kinds of genuine cries for help with powerful, miraculous acts. God gives us wonderful stories to tell. Our God is still active, he's still rescuing us, and he's still a God of miracles. Back to Psalm 
107. Verse 7 says, He led the homeless straight to safety, to a city where they could live. He led the prisoners, in verse 14, from the darkness and deepest gloom. He snapped their chains. He sent out his word and healed the sick, snatching them from the door of death. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. Verses 8, 15, 21, and 31. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. And verse 32. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. Earlier, I mentioned Jesus challenging the religious views um, about disability and sin. And the story I was thinking of is in John chapter 9. Uh, and it's right at the start, at verse 1, where Jesus encounters a blind man and his disciples ask the cause, whether it was his parents or him who sinned. But Jesus answers in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God would be displayed in him. God gives us breakthroughs. God gives us blessings. And God even gives us miracles to strengthen our faith. But more than that, I think he gives us those things to strengthen the faith of those around us. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Don't keep your faith to yourself. Uh, I know it's scary to talk to other people. I know it can be a little uncomfortable to, to share your story. But... I do think it gets easier with practice, so if we go back to my first thought, try telling someone in the foyer your story and how the Lord has redeemed you. Um, I, think, I think I can safely say we're all friends here and we'll all be encouraging. I think, yeah, I, I, pro I promise, okay? I'm promising that we'll be encouraging. So don't be too intimidated. Um, but as well as practice, I think it gets easier when you know that God has given you that story for a specific purpose. Um, it was likely for your good that you went through something, uh, but I think sometimes it's even just to build up one other person. Uh, if your story can impact just one other person, then... I think, that, I think that makes it worth it. Um, we may never know the impact that even just sharing a small story with someone can have on them. I may never have thought my testimony was very exciting, uh, but I've realized that my story still has an impact. I can encourage kids and youth growing up in Christian families like I did um, I can see so clearly with hindsight the plan God had for me to not get a scholarship when I was going to uni, which meant I could finish earlier so that I could do the peak program at Camp Clayton. Um, it was so obvious looking back, but at the time, it was a bit hard. In the chaos of planning our wedding, there were heaps of small coincidences, um, like finding the perfect place, the perfect shoes, the perfect combi. Um, and there's the blessing of our turtle house, as we call it, um, the sign that we prayed for when we, were, when we were looking for our house. There's all of these seemingly small things in my life and many, many others, but they've all cemented 
the faith that I have up here and can so confidently proclaim to all of you guys. Um, they're all little stories, little snippets of my life, and I believe that they can all have an impact on other people. All right, the last section of Psalm 107, from th verse 33. He changes rivers into deserts and springs of water into dry, thirsty land. He turns the fruitful land into salty wastelands because of the wickedness of those who live there. But he also turns deserts into pools of water, the dry land into springs of water. He brings the hungry to settle there and to build their cities. They sow their fields, plant their vineyards, and harvest their bumper crops. How he blesses them. They raise large families there, and their, herd, and their herds of livestock increase. When they decrease in number and become impoverished through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, the Lord pours contempt on their princes, causing them to wander in trackless wastelands. But he rescues the poor from trouble and increases their families like flocks of sheep. The godly will see these things and be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. An understanding of God's incredible power and his sovereignty is core to a Christian faith that stands the test of time. Christians are often given incredible gifts and blessings, and we get to celebrate those, celebrate the good things, and give God glory for the great things that he's done. But don't be discouraged when you find yourself in the valley. Don't despair. Uh, humble yourself before God and cry for help like these exiles and wait patiently for him. Know that he is still in control. When we forget that everything we have is from him and everything we do is for him, I think we end up back in these wastelands. Uh, we are told to rejoice in our sufferings because we are built up by them and God works through them. Um, it's easier to give God glory when we realize that we're weak and he is strong. Let us not forget that the Christian life does not mean everything will be perfect. Uh, but that even when things aren't perfect and we're in our trials, we can still give glory to God. Expecting God to fix everything straight away and never allowing us to struggle with things, I think is a bit dangerous. And I don't think it's a good foundation for us to build our faith on. Uh, God may not show up in the way that we want. God may not show up when we want or how we thought he would. Uh, everyone's story will be different. But take encouragement from the history of a people group that never had it easy. But God has redeemed you and he loves you no matter what.